Gabriel, the angel, was sent from God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man called Joseph from the family of David. The virgin was called Mary. Greetings, favored one, said the angel when he arrived. May the Lord be with you. She was disturbed at this and wondered what such a greeting might mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, said the angel to her. You're in favor with God. Listen, you will conceive in your womb and will have a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be a great man. He will be the son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never come to an end. How will this happen? Mary said to the angel. I am still a virgin. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, replied the angel, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For that reason, the Holy One who was born from you will be called God's Son. Let me tell you this too. Your cousin Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. This is the sixth month for her, a woman who people used to say was barren. With God, you see, nothing is impossible. Here I am, said Mary. I am the Lord's servant. Let it happen to me, as you have said. Then the angel left her. A good story brings about a response. It either brings about a response of laughter or of joy or sometimes of anger or frustration. Isn't it funny how we can watch a television series or a movie with completely fictional characters, but while watching it, we get angry with them as if they are real people. How could you do that? It's like, I, I, it's, a, it's not a real, this is not a real situation. This is not a real person. But we get so caught up in a good story that it brings an, a response out of us. I know people who've watched documentaries. They're like an hour long. And based off of this hour long documentary, they will change entire things in their life. Whether it be their workout habits or, or their eating or whatever it is, they'll watch an hour long documentary and they'll change everything. It's like if somebody else would have told you that information, you probably would not have made those changes. But because of how the documentary put the story together, it moved you to action. It made you say, oh, I've connected with this. I need to do something I need to change. Because a really good story, a really powerful story will move us to change. It will move us to see the world differently. So there's one level of story that brings about happiness and laughter and joy, but then there's another level of story that we connect with it in such a way that we can't help but to be changed by it, to be transformed by it. And my concern is that when we come to the Christmas story, is that this is the greatest or one of the greatest stories ever, but yet we become so familiar with it Okay, I got to get to the Christmas Eve service so that I can get home. And, you know, we've become so familiar with the Christmas story, whether it be through services or whether it be through media or whether it be through lawn decorations. We've become so familiar with the story that we just hear it quickly and move on with our lives or we just read it quickly. But if we pause for a moment and look closely at the Christmas story and just take a moment to let this story speak to us, I know that there is power and there is something at work within this story that God wants to speak to you this morning. He wants you to feel like you can move forward in the life that he has given you. And there's something in this story that I believe can help us all move to making different changes in our lives and they are changes that are gonna make us more and more like Jesus. So my request is that you would let this story speak to you today that even if you've heard it or read it a million times before, that you would not be on autopilot right now, but you would just take a moment and let this story speak to you. Because when we get to the Christmas story, Luke, the guy who recorded this story 2,000 years ago, he's a master storyteller. We just have to pay attention to some of the details. Luke starts the story this way in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. He said, in the sixth month, Gabriel the angel was sent from God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth. That first line, in the sixth month. 
Luke's already letting us know that he's up to something. He's referring to Elizabeth's pregnancy, and Elizabeth was carrying John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the one who's going to prepare the way for Jesus. Luke is saying, hey, things are moving along. The one who's about to introduce the Messiah into the world, the one who's going to make the path, the John the Baptist, the, the story's progressing. Something's happening. Luke's letting his readers know we're getting closer and closer to Jesus entering the story. He's already doing something to get his readers to start paying attention. We're getting closer to the big moment. So in the sixth month, Gabriel the angel was sent from God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man called Joseph from the family of David. The virgin was called Mary. So God sends this angel Gabriel to this place called Galilee. Now Galilee was a small town. And there's this young girl, she's a virgin named Mary, and she's engaged to a man named Joseph. Now Joseph is from the line of David, which would have been a lineage of kingdom, a lineage of royalty. So Luke's giving us a little hint that something else is happening here. But then he takes us to, he takes us to Galilee in the story, which is just this little no-name small town. And then he starts to highlight Mary. And Mary is literally actually just a small town girl. She's just in this little small town, and she's a virgin. There's nothing about Mary's family or her line that's like, hey, we're going we're gonna to highlight her. But Luke says, start paying attention. Luke loves to do this, by the way. If you read Luke's gospel closely enough, what he will do over and over again is he will start to highlight characters who people in the first century context would have been like, those people? That guy? That girl? Luke loves to flip the script. Luke loves to start highlighting characters that most people would overlook. And so from here, Mary has a conversation with the angel Gabriel, and we'll go to that in just a moment. But after, but, but I want to move past that for just a second and get to what Gabriel tells Mary about the son that she is going to have, because this continues to bring us into the story that he's telling. He says this in verses 31 through 33. Check this out. Listen. You will conceive in your womb and will have a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be a great man, and he'll be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David his father, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. This sentence here is so important. His kingdom will never come to an end. Back in this context in the first century, there was a Roman poet by the name of Virgil, and Virgil had recorded that Rome was referred to as the kingdom that would have no end. So Luke is putting this story together and saying, no, 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 no. Caesar's not the real king. There's a different king who is coming, and his, king is the, his kingdom is the true eternal kingdom. And Mary, you are going to be the mother of this king. And he's coming from the line of David, so he's the Messiah for God's people, but he's also going to be the Messiah for all the world because his kingdom will have no end. This would have been extremely controversial. I'll be the first to admit, I do not like being in the middle of controversy, but I do kind of like witnessing controversy sometimes. I will find myself watching videos on YouTube just because people are arguing. I'm like, I got to watch another one because I like watching controversy unravel, but I don't want to be in the middle of it. If you were a first century reader reading Luke's story, you'd have been like, this guy is stirring the pot right now. He's saying, wait, there's another kingdom that will have no end other than Rome. There's this leader who's coming. What is happening right here? And this king is coming from this virgin girl in this small town called Galilee. Luke is setting the stage up for a really compelling story. Luke sets the stage of an unlikely place with an unlikely girl who will mother an unlikely king to fulfill an unlikely purpose. Luke sets the stage of an, un of an unlikely place, Galilee, with an unlikely girl, Mary, she's just a virgin, she's not even married yet, who will mother an unlikely king who will have a kingdom over Rome, which was the most powerful force in the world at the time, and he's going to fulfill an unlikely purpose. Some of you just need to simply hear this this morning. God loves using unlikely people in unlikely places to fulfill an unlikely purpose. 
Some of you are here this morning and you've been going through some stuff in your life, some difficulties. Maybe it's broken relationships. Maybe it's something you yourself have done. Maybe it's something that just happened to you and you're here to church service this morning and you're like, I just got to get through this thing because then I'm going to get on to Christmas later. But you need to hear this this morning is God wants to do something in and through your life. And you might be thinking, oh, you know, I'm just so-and-so living in Buffalo, New York, this, you know, this town that has all the snow and the bills. Hopefully, I mean, they barely won last night, but hopefully they can do something in the playoffs. And I'm just in this town where, you know, our team needs to win the Super Bowl someday, but we just can't seem to do it. And I'm just, you know, I just, I, I'm, I'm just a no, I'm just, I'm just an unlikely person in this, in this Northeastern place. I, I don't even know, but God specializes in using unlikely people in unlikely places for his unlikely purpose. He has something he wants to do in and through your life. And what Luke does that's so compelling here is he begins to position Mary as an example in this story for us to follow. He puts her in a place in the stage that he set that Mary's example of trusting God is an example that we can follow. See, Mary is revealed in this story as disturbed yet devoted. And disturbed, I don't mean, you know, weird. I mean perplexed, confused, curious. Mary is revealed as disturbed yet devoted. And this is a tension that I want to invite us to live in in this Christmas season. That when we are walking and living in the will of God, we will oftentimes find ourselves in a spot where we are disturbed, but yet still devoted to what God is calling us to do because we don't have all of the answers, but we know that we are in his hand and he is leading us forward. So first I want to talk to you about disturbed. What exactly does that look like? What exactly does that mean? Well, to go back in the story just a little bit, check this out in Luke chapter 1, verses 28 through 30. Greetings favored one, said the angel when he arrived. May the Lord be with you. She was disturbed at this. I gotta be honest, I would be disturbed too if an angel showed up out of nowhere and said greetings. I mean, I love Gabriel and everything, but Gabriel, you gotta learn some social cues, bro. This is a small town girl all by herself. And you're saying greetings favored one and she's disturbed. Obviously, you are a supernatural being coming out of nowhere. Hey, greetings, who are you? And why are you here right now? I don't know about you, but I would feel the same way. She was disturbed at this and wondered what such a greeting might mean. Yeah, I would wonder the same thing too if somebody just popped in my house when the doors were locked and my Simply Safe is on and the alarm doesn't go off and they just say, hey, greetings, who are you? And what are you doing here? Don't be afraid, Mary. Well, that's easy for you to say. Don't be afraid. You are in favor with God. The angel lets her know you have God's favor. But Luke tells us in this moment she was disturbed. What could this be? What could this mean? And I know it's Christmas time right now. And most of us would love to just think about, I can't wait to go spend time with family and eat my Christmas cookies and watch Frosty the Snowman or whatever it is you choose to watch with your family. And I just wanna relax and open gifts. And I want that for you as well. I want you to be able to enjoy time with family this Christmas season. But I don't want that to be a reason that you ignore what God has been saying to you all throughout the year. And I don't want it to be a reason for you to continue to push off what God wants to say to you moving forward. So yes, we wanna celebrate Christmas, but the celebration of Christmas is an invitation to live a different kind of life. And the different kind of life that God invites us to live into oftentimes offers a disruption and a disturbance that we wouldn't necessarily ask for ourselves. Let me ask you this question. When was the last time you have been disturbed or disrupted by a godly intervention? I'm not saying you're going to get the angel Gabriel like Mary did. But even just that nudging of the Spirit of God and speaking into your life and you've been feeling this disruption, you've been feeling this disturbance and you're like, no, 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 no. I got my plans. No, 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 I got my stuff that I need to do. No, 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 I'm just holding on for me. But God has been saying, would you let that go? I have something else I wanna do in and through your life. And it's actually gonna be far greater than the things that you could have ever possibly planned for yourself. 
How many of us, we've just been holding on and God's been trying to disturb. He's been trying to disrupt. He's been trying to awaken something within you because he loves you and has something for you. But you've just been holding on. I found myself in these places before where I just, I'm just going to do this. But in this moment, Mary was disturbed by this greeting from an angel. But I imagine throughout her life, she had to wrestle with this feeling of being disturbed. Because at a young age, she would have been mocked as the one who was unfaithful to her husband. She would have had to watch her son be made fun of as the fatherless child and rejected by his peers. She would have had to witness him being rejected as an adult as he was going about his ministry. This little baby who she held and loved so dearly, she would have had to witness him just being pushed away by so many, by being mocked, by being made fun of, by being ultimately rejected. And she herself would have had to experience that. This wasn't just a moment of disturbance. This was her signing up for a life of complexity and great fulfillment and love, but also moments of distress. We have a little nine-month-old son, Clark. And last year, my wife was carrying Clark, and I witnessed firsthand she wasn't able to eat certain things. Like, that, just that very fact of carrying the baby, that can be a bit of a disruption. <laughs> That can be distressing. And Mary says, not only am I going to do that, but I'm going to commit to raising this child, to loving this child, to caring for this child. Sometimes the calling that God calls you to carry, it will interrupt your initial plans. It'll interrupt your initial ideas. There will be some pain and some complexity that comes with it. But there is a way that God desires to bless others through you from it. God ends up blessing all of humanity through Mary's son, Jesus. Do not run from the disruption even when it disturbs your initial plans and ideas. Do not run from it. Embrace it. Lean into it. It's an invitation to trust God and see what it is that he's trying to do through your life. Secondly, I want to talk about devotion because Mary is revealed as disturbed yet devoted. She stays devoted after the angel tells her, hey, you're going to have this son and he's going to be the king of the kingdom with no end. She asks, well, how will this be? Check this out in Luke chapter one, verses 34 through 38. How will this happen, said Mary to the angel? I'm still a virgin. It's a good question. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, replied the angel, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For that reason... The Holy One who is born from you will be called God's Son. Let me tell you this too. Your cousin Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. This is the sixth month for her, a woman who people used to say was barren. Stop there for just a moment. Just a, just a quick side note. When you start following God and you have this devotion towards him and there's a bit of a disruption you feel, God will oftentimes send you stories of other people who followed him and trusted him and used those to build you up. That's what the angel does here with Elizabeth's story. It's not the same miracle as Mary's miracle. It's a similar miracle. And the angel uses this story to build Mary up. And then he says this, with God, you see, nothing is impossible. And then check out this response from Mary. Here I am, said Mary. I'm the Lord's servant girl. Let it happen to me as you've said. Then the angel left her. Said, I'm here. I'm the Lord's servant. And she doesn't just declare that in her words, but she lives a life of devotion to caring for, loving, and being with Jesus, her son. She was devoted even in the disruptions, even in the rejections, even in the pain points, she was devoted to this calling that God had on her life. What calling has God given you to carry? And there are gonna be moments where you're like, can I stay devoted to this? Can I keep moving forward in this? What, what is it that God is calling you forward into? Because Mary, was so impressive about her, is that we know she continued to stay devoted to the role of caring for her son and fo ultimately following her son as the disciples did. 
Because when Jesus is at his lowest moment, hanging on a cross, rejected, all of his friends have left him, all of his closest followers, they've moved, we don't know, they've ran away. Look at what John chapter 19, verse 25 tells us about Mary. Jesus' mother was standing beside his cross. She was devoted. And can you imagine the disturbance and the distress she was feeling when she was watching her son beaten and bruised and rejected on that cross? The son that she had once held as a baby? Can you imagine the disruption she felt in that moment? But yet she was devoted because she knew God was up to something. She stayed by her son. There's an old Southern gospel song called Then Came the Morning. And in one part of the song, it gives a perspective of Mary throughout the life of Jesus. It talks about the Christmas story with the angel and the star. It talks about the wedding at Cana when she's there and she says, do whatever he tells you. And I just want to read to you this short part of the song that gives a perspective of Mary. I'm not going to sing it. Don't worry about that. That won't be a problem. But it's so beautiful. It says, the song says this. The angel, the star, the kings from afar, the wedding, the water, the wine. Now it was done. They'd taken her son, wasted before his time. She knew it was true. She'd watched him die too. She'd heard them call him just a man. This is the line I love. But deep in her heart, she knew from the start, somehow her son would live again. Deep in her heart, she knew from the start, somehow her son would live again. Devotion, commitment, standing by her son and the calling of God. And you know why we, I know it is worth it for us to be devoted to Jesus? Because above all else, he has demonstrated his devotion to you. Above all else, he has demonstrated his devotion to us. And that's at the heart of the Christmas story, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he demonstrated in his life and his ministry what it means for us to be truly human, to be who it is that God designed us to be. And then in his death, burial, and resurrection, he is declaring through his love for you that he is devoted to you. He is committed to you. And he has something for you. See, I think there's a danger if we end up living just disturbed. If we live just disturbed, we may never actually follow God in doing something because we will always be fearful. But there's also a danger in living just devoted and never allowing the Spirit of God to disturb us in some way because then I would ask you, have you really been listening for God or have you just been telling God everything you want Him to do and making your own plans and agendas? I know I can do that sometimes. I think we have to learn to live in this tension of disturbed yet devoted, fearful yet faithful, curious yet confident, perplexed yet filled with God's purpose because in Christ's devotion for us, he has called us to be devoted to him and there might be moments that we don't know what's coming next, but the power of the resurrected Christ dwells within you. He is your comfort, your peace, your guide, and he he will lead you into the life that God has for you. And that's the hope that we begin to see and experience at Christmas. So you might feel like an unlikely person in an unlikely place. Then you're in just the right place to start listening for God and to allow him to use you in a unique and powerful way. And I want to invite you to live in this tension of disturbed yet devoted because it is in that tension that I believe God will start to do something in and through your life. He loves you. He has something for you. He created you with an intent 
and purpose. And he desires all of us to be a part of his new creation mission. And he invites all of us to be a part of the story that he is telling of redemption and resurrection and new life. That's at the heart of the hope of Christmas.